Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to the introductory series on fluid mechanics. In the first lecture, the very basic lecture, we looked at the brief differences between solids and fluids using the concepts of a deforming shear force and an intermolecular attractive forces. I introduced uh, the property of uh, density and we also looked at the specific gravity. So during that discussion, I briefly talked about something called as a continuum hypothesis and according to which if we take a sufficient amount of sample of our fluid, the density that we would measure, it will not be affected. So in the video today, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that so that you can understand what this hypothesis is. And in the second part of this video, I'll introduce you to another property of fluids that is called as viscosity. So without any further ado, let's get started. So let's first talk about the continuum hypothesis. To understand this, consider any piece of substance which could be a solid such as rock or a fluid such as a flowing water. So when we look at any of these substance, when we look at these through our naked eyes, we see it as a continuous medium. We're not really able to see the molecules that compose these substances. It is only when we would use something like a microscope that we would be able to see all those tiny molecules that are actually making up these substances. And along with the molecules, there is also a lot of gaps between the molecules. So there's a lot of empty space that is also present in any of the substance. Therefore, if we really want to understand the mechanics of fluids, we should be actually studying the properties and the dynamics of each of these molecules, which are constantly in motion. And this is something that is actually being done by the people who study kinetic theory of gases, for example. But I hope you would agree with me that uh, there are a lot of molecules and uh, tracking them down, each of them would be a very a non-trivial task. It would be a very hard job because if you would be, if you consider a very small amount of water let us say a spoon of water it contains a lot of molecules which you can estimate using the Avogadro's equation i think it comes down to approximately a quintillion molecules which i can't even imagine how many zeros are there so there are a lot of molecules and uh, tracking them each of them is quite hard so then the question comes can we do some sort of simplification so that we're not really understanding how each molecule behaves but we are able to understand the gross effect that is produced by all of these molecules put together. So one of the length scales that characterize this molecular motion is the mean free path. That is the average distance a molecule is taking before it collides with another molecule. And the continuous continuum assumption says that as long as the characteristic size or characteristic scale of our uh, medium is large enough, as compared to this mean free path, the, we can treat the substance as a continuous distribution. And this makes our life so much easier. And to give you some perspective about the numbers, and if I consider the air in the room, the mean free path at the standard pressure is approximately 50 nanometers. So if I take a very small sample, say something like this, which could be of, of, of the order of a few centimeters or a millimeters, this would satisfy the continuum assumption that is in this span I can assume I can treat the air as a continuous distribution and I can forget uh, about the molecular structure and all those empty spaces that are present in this medium. So this is one way of uh, theoretically looking at uh, the idea of continuum assumption and uh, I'll explain it an another way via a thought experiment. So in the last lecture, we have introduced the concept of density, which is the mass of the substance divided by its volume. So we would do the same thing. In our thought experiment, we would consider this particular room and we would consider the total air that is currently present in the room. So if we do the mass of the air divided by the volume of this imaginary room right now, uh, we would get the density of the air. So this would give us some number that is currently present. So now what we would do is we would take in our thought experiment a smaller part of the room. So we are not really shrinking the room. We are just cutting down the volume that we are considering, right? 
So now if I take half of the room and consider the mass in that half of the volume, I hope you would agree with me that if I take the density in this halved case, it would not be very different than the density in the first case because the molecules that are comprising in either of the cases, they are very, very large and it doesn't really matter if I take the half of the space because ultimately density is the intensive property. It is not really going to be dependent upon uh, the extent of the sample as long as we are taking a large enough sample. Now when we would be shrinking down the room or the shrinking down the imaginary volume further and further closer to the mean free path. So what might be happening at that case is suppose if I have this particular volume and if the molecules are moving something off the scale of this particular motion. So it might happen that at some time instant there are let us say 10 molecules in this volume but at another instant there could be 15 because the molecules are of the order or they are moving uh, on the length scale which is of the order of the size of this imaginary volume. So I hope you can agree. Uh, I am not sure if you are, but uh, if you think about it, if the size of my imaginary volume becomes comparable to the mean free path, so the molecules can go frequently in and out of that imaginary volume and that is going to affect our density measurements. So beyond a certain point in the length scales, uh, the density measurements would be or the density that you would measure it would be affected by the size of your imaginary volume and that is precisely what defines the limitation of our continuum hypothesis that if the volume is very very small where the effect of the mean molecular motion through the mean free path is going to be reflected then we're not really in the safe region and our measurements are going to be a function of how many molecules are actually present. So this is uh, one side of looking at the continuum assumption where we are shrinking down the imaginary volume. Now let us look at the flip side. If we keep expanding the volume and if we keep going up in the air further up. So I hope uh, you from the basic sciences you know that as we go up higher in the atmosphere there would come a point where we would we would be approaching vacuum and before that there is a uh, there is a region of very low pressures because ultimately there are not enough molecules so if we keep going up higher there would come certain point uh, above which your uh, imaginary volume would uh, start to not have enough molecules and at that point also the density measurements are going to be affected uh, therefore if I plot this density which I'm talking about in terms of or as a function of the size of this imaginary volume I would get a plot that would look something like this and the region in which this curve remains almost flat is that zone where the idea of the continuum hypothesis remains valid and we can forget about what is happening on the micro microscopic scale and only concern ourselves with the uh, bulk behavior of fluids. So I hope that this would give you some idea about how the continuum assumption is actually working out. Do give a thumbs up if you understand and if you don't please drop it down in the comments so that I can understand where you are stuck in the process and I can try to rescue you. And before finishing up the video we would talk about a property of the fluids which is called as viscosity. So viscosity is a property that is exclusive to the fluids. We don't really talk about uh, viscosity when it comes to solids and physically it determines how thick a fluid is, uh, fluid feels like. So if we consider our experiment of pouring water and honey into a jar, you can see that the honey drops at a much slower rate as compared to water. And this is because the viscosity of honey is actually much larger than the viscosity of water. And if I recall the numbers correctly, I think it's about 10,000 times larger than the viscosity of water. So honey and water, they both are fluids. And when we pour them down, gravity is the force that is trying to deform them, right? And here, if we are saying that the viscosity of honey is larger than the viscosity of water, it means that the internal resistance that the honey is applying on the gravitational force on or on the deforming force, it is much larger. So uh, technically viscosity tells us how much a fluid 
would resist any kind of deforming force so water is not able to resist it as much as the honey does there are two different kinds of viscosity that you would uh, come across when you would be going through books where one is called as a dyn dynamic viscosity which is represented by a symbol mu another one is a kinematic viscosity which is represented by a symbol nu so it's a very uh, it sounds very similar and uh, i would put up a link uh, to one of the videos by the efficient engineer which gives a very a uh, nice visual representative understanding of viscosity and i think you should go through that so please let me know in the comments below if this video was helpful to you in the coming weeks i'll try to upload these videos on a more more regular basis and if there is anything in, uh, in the context of introductory fluid mechanics that you would like me to cover please feel free to write it down as well so until the next time please take care and i'll see you then bye bye